Hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a weekly talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. You may also know me from my other Beatles program, which is a syndicated radio show on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, and also from my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts, first of all, the leading man when it comes to Beatle news on the internet for decades now, and he writes for Variety and Billboard and Access.com, a whole bunch of websites and publications, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have our resident musicologist who wrote for the New York Times in their classical department for many years, was their Beatle guy at the New York Times, and he's uh, also authored a few Beatle books, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and also The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and that's our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Kent. Hello, everyone. On today's show, our main topic is going to be the Beatles BBC recordings, but we're going to be a little bit more specific when we talk about these BBC uh, recordings and performances, because we're going to try to focus mainly on 36 songs. And those are the songs that the Beatles did for BBC Radio that they didn't release for EMI Parlophone. But before we talk about that, we have a few news items, as usual, to get to. One of which uh, broke a couple of days ago, and that concerns uh, a new John Lennon stamp coming out, which we heard about quite a while back, but now we have a definitive date for it. It's uh, September the 7th, and this is the John Lennon Forever stamp. It's part of their Music Icons commemorative series, and... um, from what I've been reading, the stamps are coming out in a pane of 16. And with the uh, stamp pane design, it resembles that of a 45 sleeve, hmm. which is pretty cool if you think about it. And each horizontal row is supposed to have different gradients of color. And there are supposed to be four different stamp varieties. No doubt appealing to all the Beetle collectors out there. <laughs> and so the, uh, the photo of John... Uh, on the front, it says it's from the Walls and Bridges period, uh, of course, taken by Bob Gruen. That was in August of 1974. And I've also read that there's an image of John on the reverse of the pane uh, that's familiar uh, to all of us. It's a black and white photo taken of John with a white piano at the time to uh, promote his Imagine album. So are we excited about this? I'm really, uh, you know, I love collecting some of these um commemorative stamps well, I, re- I remember i remember the the excitement that everybody had over the yellow submarine stamp uh, a few years ago so but this is actually i think a little cooler um by the way the the black and white photo was taken by peter fordham so but yeah i, I this is this is really exciting and it's going to be interesting to see what happens the first day of issue and you know uh, if you're going to be able to find these things right away probably not i mean i would i would think there there's going to be a lot of people after this as you get four versions too <laughs> i think you, you know, can usually I wonder. you usually send away for a first day cover or something like that right right i think you right can. you can yeah i think but that's i think what I what the, it looks from the picture and i'm looking at the at the press release on the uh, usps.com site it's going to all be sold together oh so that's that's the way it looks. I mean, that's the way it looks to me. And then you, you know, you just punch them out. That's again. I mean, we don't have one in hand, and it doesn't say that. Here's what it says in the press release: it "says for the first time, the postal service is revealing the full pane for these stamps, featuring a photograph of John Lennon taken by Bob Gruen." I'm, I'm scanning down here. It says, uh, you're right. It has it has different gradations. And it says Lennon's signature appears at the top of the stamps, USA, the peace symbol, and the forever denomination appear al- along the bottom. My guess is that you'll buy the whole thing. That's my guess. I, I can't see them selling them separately, at least not that way. Um, All right. Well, I'm going to check with my local post office, see what they know. (laughs) (laughs) 
Usually they don't know much about these things, but uh, I'll right. see if I can find out more information. But about the, it. the design seems to indicate that they're not going to break it up for customers. I mean, they ha- they have generic forever stamps, so I can't imagine that they would sell these separately. But I don't, you know, I don't know. Hmm. Well, we'll see about that. We will see. All right, Steve, you had some news about a new book on Ringo coming out. Kevin Roach, who's done books on George Harrison, John, I believe he's done George, John, and Paul. Uh, he's done uh, books on their backgrounds in Liverpool and their family, you know, their family trees and all this stuff. Is doing one on Ringo, and the book is available for pre-order. He said, so you should be able to find if you look up on Amazon. Under Kevin Roach, you should be able to find it. Actually, I could probably do that right now while we're sitting here. Uh, But yeah, and the books are his past books. I I think you guys have seen his his past books, and they are very well researched uh, and detailed. So this will be a good buy. Mm -hmm. This will be a good buy. So, all right. You also had something there, Steve about a quote from Ron Howard that Ron, uh, is regarding Ron, the new Star Wars movie. Right. Ron Howard, um, uh, who directs the new Han Solo prequel uh, uh, in the Star Wars, uh, continuing continuing number of Star Wars movies that seem to come out every three months, um, <laughs> was talking in an er- interview about directing Star Wars, and he compared it to directing... Uh, eight days a week, the, the Beatles touring years, he said, the level of anticipation talking about the Star Wars film is unlike anything I've done. You fall into it, and it's amazing. It was a little bit like the Beatles documentary that I took on. I could tell from the moment it was announced, Ron, don't mess this up. So I immediately felt the same thing with this. The fans care, and they should care. Mm-hmm. Which is real, I mean, which probably is even more true with Star Wars than it is with the Beatles. But why would yeah. you say that? Because the uh, uh, there's, I think there's probably more Star Wars fans now nowadays. Uh, given that we're talking across multitudes of generations, I'm. I mean, I'm just it, it, the culturally. I think Star Wars has a bigger impact on the, on everyone than the Beatles do at the moment. That's not to say the Beatles don't have an impact, but I think be given the Star Wars franchise and. I mean, in all the pro- products you see in the stores and all that stuff, I think, you know, Star Wars is huge. So there's no getting around oh, that. Yeah, it's it's an amazing dynasty. Yes. And, and who would have thought absolutely. when it started that it would be lasting all these years? And, and it's it's to their credit for all the work that's been done on them. Well, I have, a like I said, I, my comment about movies coming out every three months, I think they're, they used to be big events. They're not as big events as they were, at least I think so. I mean, I did not see Rogue One until, you know, just a couple of months ago because mm. I, I watched it on DVD. I haven't been to the theater since uh, Force Awakens, so I haven't seen – my son is gone, but I haven't. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll wait for them on DVD. So, All right. Well, you do know that there's so many Beatle fans that are fussy about everything that comes out, so – Oh, yes. I do. It's very similar to Star Wars there, so – so oh, that, that's true too. Mm-hmm. That's true. So, okay. Also, um, Alan, you wanted to talk about a musician that just passed away named Matt Marks. All oh, right, um, Matt Marks's connection to the Beatles world is that he did a uh, an arrangement, an orchestration of Revolution Nine, um, probably the only cover version. Well. Probably some other people have probably done weird cover versions that weren't quite. But but Matt Marx's was an, an orchestration of the piece as it actually is, and he got all the details in there um, for live orchestra. Um, mm. Matt was a you know he was a French horn player and a composer, and he first turned up as a member of this um, new music orchestra called Alarm Will Sound, and that's who he did the. Uh, Revolution Number no. Nine arrangement for um, also arranged things by um, Aphex Twin, which they they put out an album of Aphex Twin stuff orchestrated. Aphex Twin is a, an electronica guy, and 
uh, Revolution 9, I, I've seen them play live a couple of times, and uh, after the first time they played it live, I managed to get a tape of it, and um, when I was teaching criticism at NYU, um, I used to play it for my class every year, along with the Beatles track, which, shockingly, a number of these grad students at NYU had never heard. <laughs> um, um, but a lot of them also hadn't heard I Am the Walrus. Yes, it was really shocking. But, um, you know, I, I would play them both versions and have them write something about, you know, what what they felt. And, and you know, most of them felt as, you know, I have to say I do that, you know, the, the Beatles version is obviously the preferable one. But there's something really astonishing about what he did to bring the thing to life in a way that could be played. And, you know, and when they played it, they had fun with it. You know, you've got players walking around with their musicians going up to the mic saying, you know, the Watusi, the twist, all, all of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I had posted a a clip of it. There, there's a clip of a live performance on YouTube. You can find it if you look up Alarm Will Sound Revolution 9. Um mm possibly also Matt Marks. But yeah, Matt was, you know, 38 years old, died of a heart attack. Um, he was, for anyone in into the sort of younger end of the classical new music world, I mean, he was someone everyone knew, everyone loved. Um, he was a very funny guy, very sweet guy. Um, I spoke to him a few times, you know, at concerts or uh, at this thing called the New Music Gathering, which he was a founder of. Uh, it was sort of a big new music festival and symposium every year. Um, and I sent him some outtakes of, well, the uh, the acetate of the unreleased mix of Revolution 9, since he seemed to be interested. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, but by then he had already made his arrangements, so it, you know, it wasn't going to have any effect uh, on what he did, but he was kind of keen on having it and you know i gotta say you know he did that at least 10 or 12 years ago so he would have been like in his early 20s and i kind of i, I kind of found it very heartening that a composer in his early 20s would be fascinated enough with revolution number no. nine to want to make a, a an orchestral arrangement of it mm. so. did you ask him why that particular piece he wanted um, to work on I'm, I, you know, I probably did, and I can't remember what he said. I mean, I, he just, he just was fascinated with it, and, uh, mm. you know, and Alarm Will Sound used it as part of a sort of a, a stage play that they put together, in in which the the premise of the play was that John Lennon and Karl Heinz Stockhausen were supposed to meet at some point in 1969. The play is called, I think, 1969, and even though Revolution 9 is a little little bit earlier than 1969, um, they wanted to include that. You know, the, the whole premise of the thing, I ended up writing a piece about the, the stage thing because it was going to have its premiere, and, uh, you know, I already knew the Revolution Number 9, which had been around for a few years earlier. And so... I looked into it, and it turns out that the entire thing was based on a misunderstanding that Stockhausen's assistant had about whether this meeting was supposed to take place, because, you know, the Stockhausen world, it sounded, you know, like an interesting rumor, and it might be kind of cool, and Stockhausen's on the cover of Sgt. Pepper, and, and McCartney used to mention him in interviews around 1966 when he was going through his own avant-garde period. Um, yeah. But, you know, to anyone who knows sort of the details of what the Beatles were up to in 1969, the idea of Stockhausen and Lennon meeting and then Stockhausen and the Beatles doing something together was like, that was not real. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it was an interesting fantasy and it got that piece onto the stage. So why not? <laughs> wow. I know that the group, the Fab Foe, Mm -hmm. have done the entire white album live mm -hmm. and they do Ooh. revolution number no. nine but i haven't seen them do the show so i don't know what exactly they do to it i would imagine a lot of the beatles recording is probably piped in Could to be. the keyboards 
Yeah, Fish does the whole live, live album, um, White Album Live too. And I, if I remember correctly, what they did for Revolution Nine was just sort of a bunch of random noise. It, it wasn't really a, a serious evocation of the piece. Hmm. But so. but Mark did it. Mark did it note for note. That was what was really nice about that. And I I had never heard it before you posted it, Alan. Huh. And I thought it was amazing. I really did. I couldn't believe it. There is also a studio recording of it that Alarm Will Sound did um, on an album called Modernism that came out mm. just a couple of years ago. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right. Um, I have one other news item. I don't know. Do you guys have anything else? Mm-mm. No. I had sent the two of you a link for this because I didn't know if if the two of you were aware of this album that Keely Smith made. This was back in 1964. Mm -hmm. Keely Smith is really known as being a great pop and jazz singer. She was married to Louis Prima. They made a lot of hit records in the 50s, and she went on to have a solo career. But she made this album called Keely Smith Sings, the John Lennon-Paul McCartney songbook. And apparently it did very well in the UK. And according to the record label, which is Real Gone Music, that's the same record company, by the way, that just reissued Harry Nilsson's Pussycats. But they say on their website that what makes this significant is that it's listed as being the first of its kind when a respected pop singer tackled Beatles songs. Hmm. And at a time when the Beatles were still new, and the um, the establishment, the traditional establishment, were either not ready to give the Beatles their due respect, or they were waiting to see if they were going to be uh, a flash in the pan. Keely Smith risked being ridiculed for either being too hip for her peers, or being too square for the young teenagers. Hmm. So it's now available. It's been reissued after being out of print for uh, quite a while. Again, it's called Keely Smith Sings the John Lennon Paul McCartney Songbook. Did you guys know about this album? I did not. I did not. I, I mean, I'd never heard of it before. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I'm not a big Keeley Smith fan, but um, no, I had not heard of it. Me, I'm going to look at the cover and see if the cover looks somewhat familiar. Uh, there it is. No, the cover doesn't look familiar either. It says it's available for pre-order and it'll be released June 1st. Oh, okay. But the MP3s are available now. Mm-hmm. So the digital has already been released, but the uh, rest of it won't come out until uh, June 1st, the actual CD. So, okay. Interesting. Any other news? Nope. All right, then. Let's go to our main topic of discussion, which are the Beatles BBC recordings, but more specifically, these 36 songs that the Beatles did for BBC Radio, which they never released for EMI. And um, for me personally, although... The BBC recordings are just fascinating to listen to. What what drew me to the BBC recordings, first of all, were all these other songs. Because what's more alluring than hearing songs that the Beatles never released? Mm-hmm. And um, early on, when this stuff was bootlegged, it was so exciting. And I loved the, the uh, two double CDs that came out officially, although they don't have all 36 of these songs. But um, I have a lot of things to say about it, but I think maybe I should let you guys talk about these songs and in general what the bbc performances mean to you and um why don't we uh go to alan first okay um what they mean to me in general well you know as as you said really it it, it sort of seriously expands our view of what they played and how they played it i mean a lot of these mm-hmm. songs that we know you know from chuck berry and um, you know, various other people. And, and so the songs themselves weren't familiar, but then hearing the Beatles do a song that you know that uh, you never heard them do before is is always really a kick. Um, I, I kind of wish that EMI had gotten them out a bit earlier. I mean, by the time they brought out their official ones, I think we had all heard them on bootleg many, 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 many times. And there are still... You know, not everything is out. Um, I, I kind of wish that EMI would do a comprehensive, or EMI Universal, Apple, whatever the hell, uh, would do <laughs> <laughs> a 
a comprehensive set of all the BBC recordings or all the, you know, the ones that are known to still exist, which are out there for collectors, you know, I mean, they're, they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot by not serving the market that can get them elsewhere if uh, Apple doesn't give it to them. The other interesting thing about it for me is that there are a number of songs like Hippie Hippie Shake, you know, not an incredible song, really. I mean, I can't say that I'm really sorry that they never recorded it for EMI, but they did it you know, quite a number of times on the BBC. And, um, you know, even things like, you know, Sweet Little Sixteen, which they didn't do too many times, but they did it in close succession on a couple of uh, BBC shows, you know, that were sort of near each other. You kind of wonder whether it was something, whether these things were tracks they were considering recording for EMI. I mean, there's they didn't even attempt them, or we would know. But, um, you know, there has to be yeah. a reason. Yeah. I'm just thinking there has to be a reason that they did them so much, you know, the, the ones that they repeated over and over. I mean, there were other things, like Soldier of Love and Carol and Clarabella and Lend Me Your Comb and That's All Right Mama, all of which appeared on one show that they only did the once, you know? Um mm. And uh, I'll be on my way, you know. I mean, you, you kind of get the impression with I'll be on my way, which is the only original that is among the 36 that uh, weren't done for EMI. You kind of have the impression that they performed it at the BBC mainly to make a demo, <laughs> you know, to give to Billy J or something. Mm. It was perfect just the way it was. Yeah, yeah, that could that could easily have been released um, as an EMI track. I, I don't know why they never took that into the studio themselves. Yeah, so many of these songs, these 36 songs, they could have released for EMI. But, yeah. you know, things were happening so rapidly for, for the band, and they were progressing and evolving so quickly. And so, really... By the time 1965 came around, we only have a few covers. Mm -hmm. So um, thankfully, they did all these songs. And what to me is kind of remarkable is that, you know, 1963, which I really wish there'd be a documentary just on that one year, mm -hmm. because that was the big breakout year for the Beatles in the UK. And they were so busy day to day, and they did so much on BBC radio. And so many of these songs, like, like we said, there's 36 altogether they didn't release. They could have just as easily just played songs from their albums. They could have, yeah. I mean, the the primary purpose is to promote your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and they, they certainly played enough from their albums, but they probably felt, well, we've done Please Please Me enough or certain songs, but let's give the fans something else to listen to. Mm -hmm. So, and even going into 1964, I remember saying that the fact that they did I forgot to remember to forget. The fact that they did any song in 1964 that wasn't on their albums is remarkable. They didn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. They could have just promoted their albums or their singles, and that's it. Yeah, and you know? by 64, I mean, it's not as if they were still playing these in concert either. You know, early on, yeah, you know, it was a uh, mm. mix of what they were doing in concert and you know, what they were working on. But, uh, you know, as you go further into the Beatles era, you know, when they were putting out records, we have recordings of a lot of shows from 63 on, and they don't have, you know, Three Cool Cats and Hippie Hippie Shake and stuff like that. So it's kind mm -hmm. of interesting that, you know, they, they continue doing them in the BBC. I, I really wonder what they had in mind, you know, when they were doing it. Because they probably weren't thinking, you know, this wasn't... A time when you were thinking of uh, you were going into the into the BBC and that will give us a record of our performance you know things weren't archived and um, so they weren't doing it for any expectation that they were laying down a permanent record of this repertory mm. you know and so we, we have to be grateful that we have these recordings at all mm -hmm. and um, this was really based on a combination of some of their engineers taking home copies and fans lifting it off the radio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, what are your thoughts about these 36 songs or the BBC 
uh, performances in general? Well, first to get to the BBC form- performances in general, I mean, when I first encountered them, which was at a a record store in in uh, you know in my area, and and looking at the names of the of the songs, it was almost hard to believe. Because you know we in America didn't know anything about the BBC tracks at the time, it was hard to believe that you know that these weren't fake. Mm-hmm. I mean that was kind of the first thought that I had. I mean, is this real? And then when you heard them, obviously you know they weren't fake. You know you mm-hmm. know they were real. And then what they brought on was an understanding that the Beatles weren't just Meet the Beatles or you know the. Uh, the the stuff that we were seeing in America, there was a lot more to them. So, I mean, they they really expanded our knowledge of of uh, of the group. As far as the songs go, I mean, there's some real winners here. I mean, there and I, you know, I have I have a couple that to this day uh, I was absolutely thrilled to hear the first time out because they were just so darn good. There are others that I would probably never care to hear again. Um, one of them is I'll Be On My Way, which I really don't think is a great song. Um, You're kidding. I mean, I'm not I'll Be On... Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'll Be On My Way. No, I don't I don't particularly like that. Um, really? But anyway, I mean, there's just... Uh, some, of these, some of these are fantastic. Uh, uh, I was listening to... Um, I think it was... Uh, Glad I'll... Oh, I forgot to remember to forget. The lyrics on that are just wonderful. Have you ever listened or uh, looked at the lyrics to that? They were just, and I was listening to George sing it today, and it's, it's great. The lyrics on that are just tremendous. But there are other, I mean, other great songs. It's funny on one of the on one of the tracks when they're singing Lucille, Brian Matthews goes, and now a tribute to the Everly Brothers. Well, <laughs> I, even though the Everly Brothers did it, that's not who it was a tribute to. Which is, yeah, that was kind of funny. Um, Beautiful Dreamer, by the way, is on the. Is on the BBC sets. Yeah, it's yeah. not the second one. Right. On so, air. But I mean, there, there's some great, there's some great stuff here, and it's you know, it's great to hear them do, like Johnny Be Good, Carol. My, mm-hmm. I think my all-time favorite of all of them is Soldier of Love. I absolutely mm-hmm. adore Soldier of Love. Every time when I, I remember picking up the bootleg vinyl, and it was on contraband music as i recall and it just had the name stamped across the front and i remember seeing it and going really they're going to do this and sure enough you open the album and listen to it and it was it was in tremendous quality and john you could you could almost picture john you know doing his little hunched over thing like you saw on the cartoon show doing this i mean it's it to this day you you know that still sticks out it's a great great song uh but I mean, there, there were a lot of a lot of good songs. Like you guys are saying, some of this stuff comes from their live shows. Some some of it doesn't. I guess that's kind of weird that some of it doesn't. But Clara Bella is another one that I really like. That's another real favorite that uh, you know that uh, stands out uh, on from their BBC stuff. But yeah, I mean, this is just. This is just all great stuff. I mean, I think we've we've actually discussed this in the past, but but uh, but not specifically just the thirty six. No, not specifically the thirty six. I mean, uh, but Clarabella is one another one I love, and that made me hunt down that song and Soldier uh, or you know the, what the BBC sessions did is it made you hunt down those real deep songs like Clarabella and Soldier of Love that you'd never heard before. You mean so, hunt down the originals? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Hippie Hippie Shake is another one. I mean, they loved, they did that a lot. And they, um, you know, they they absolutely loved that one. And by the way, talking about Hippie Hippie Shake, when I interviewed Chad Romero a few years ago, he said he hoped he would get to sing the song with Paul McCartney. Uh, that has never happened to my knowledge. Uh, I'm sure we would have heard about it, but he's always hoped that he could sing the song with McCartney. So, you know, there was a concert that Paul gave in England. I think it was in Liverpool a few years ago. And he opened the concert with hippie, hippie shake. I think that was Anfield. I believe, I believe that was Anfield. It's nice to see that he brought that one back. 
Right. And it's too bad he doesn't, you know, he doesn't dig some of these songs up just for the hell of it. I think he did that for the home folks is what he did. Hmm. Uh, and it was a nice gesture. But uh, yeah, that that was very cool. I, I do remember okay. that. But I mean, there's just it, it, it. I think that's the real treasure of the BBC stuff is that you get a further look into, you know, who the Beatles were, what the Beatles were, and also for American audiences, it opened up a whole new kind of a, a whole new world almost that we didn't know about. I mean, we thought the Beatles were Meet the Beatles, you know, Beatles second album, and. We found out some of their heritage that way uh, through the BBC stuff, well, and, the, a, and the and the and the Hamburg stuff. Go ahead. From an American perspective, where we were getting only twelve tracks on an album, that's three albums worth of stuff. Right, that's right. A lot, you know, right. And to me, they could have released any of them. I mean, they they were polished enough on these recordings where they could have got into EMI and done them and nailed them, as right. they did all the covers. I mean, one of the things that I love about the BBC recordings in general, not just these, but also their own originals, too, is that you hear how great they became as a live band. There was some polish to them and certain a, le- a certain level of spontaneity at the same time, because mm-hmm. um, you really get to learn how great and quickly they progressed as a live group. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've often made mention of you compare the Beatles deck audition recordings to the please please me album and it's like night and day and that's like you know a year apart Mm -hmm. really and then since so many of these recordings not all of them but many of them came from 1963 you know that they played many of these songs live they really learned the parts really well you got to hear how each of them progressed as musicians I mean some of my favorite moments and listening to these recordings and their originals too, is hearing George Harrison progress as a, as a guitarist. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some great lead guitar work on, on songs like um, "Too Much Monkey Business." Um, I love "Sweet Little Sixteen, that version that's on live at the BBC, the first collection. "Some Other Guy," "Short of Fall," different styles mm-hmm. of playing from George, and you got to witness this. You know, we're kind of lucky in a way that. With most bands, certainly bands today, by the time they have a record contract, they're kind of already polished and ready. With these recordings, we can hear them progress as a young group of musicians before mm-hmm. our eyes. You know, and it's kind of like watching your family grow up in a way. So right. when you've got something like the, the DECA recordings, and then you hear what they sounded like on these recordings, you can see how much they advanced as a band. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's too bad that we don't have a lot more BBC recordings from everybody. I mean, there there are some really great BBC recordings that have circulated, you know, among collectors. Uh, and unfortunately, not all of them have, have been released. I can think of over the years, I've heard some animal stuff that's really good. The Rolling Stones stuff, which they just released, they altered it, but they, you know, they just released it finally. I mean that mm-hmm. stuff. Is, that stuff's been out among collectors for years. Mm-hmm. I recently heard some Manfred Mann stuff that was really good. You know, there's all sorts of stuff out there, uh, and it's too bad. I guess, I guess it's a rights thing that uh, more of that stuff hasn't been released. One point I was going to make though about the Beatles stuff is that it's really a shame. Uh, Alan, you said they waited so long. It's too bad they had to go to the to the wall almost to to put these things out and use bootlegs and you know radio you know radio tapes and all that stuff because some of this stuff really sounds tinny some of the emi released versions sound really really tinny and it's really too bad that they didn't have better quality stuff for all that i mean some of it does sound really good and for the emi stuff they did dig out what they could yeah but they don't have you they know, don't have everything there was one other source that they were able to use um should we go back maybe and talk a little bit about the sources for the stuff um sure which, which sure has, have changed a lot over the years um mm-hmm. when kevin howlett put together the first Beatles at the Beeb radio special, and it was 1982, I think. He went into the archives to 
get his hands on a bunch of the stuff that, you know, and he knew what he was looking for because by then Mark Lewis and had already written his two part piece in Beatles monthly cataloging all of the sessions. And mm -hmm. what he found was basically zilch. The tapes had been wiped and they just kept the paperwork, but they didn't keep the recordings or at least so it seemed. And in fact, when the first EMI set came out, uh, I went to the press conference. At, I think it was one of the Hard Rocks in New York. Uh, and there was a video link up to Kevin Howlett in London where they, you know, the press interviewed him. And someone, I remember someone asking the question, so when you walked into the vault, was it like going into King Tut's tomb? <laughs> and, you know, Kevin had already by then told me the story about there not being anything there. And and he said, you know, what we did was we took out an ad in the BBC Listener and said, you know, basically, you know, those shows that we always tell you that you shouldn't be taping. Well, if you happen to have taped some of these, maybe you could let us borrow your tapes. Um, and that's, you know, how they were able to get that first radio program together um, in addition to some bootlegs and if you collected bootlegs at that point you could hear certain tracks where certain audio quirks of a specific bootleg were very audible you knew exactly which bootleg they got it from but that's what they were down to they had to use tapes they got from listeners and bootlegs mainly um, there were a couple of discs of, uh, of shows like you know pressed discs um, and they were able to use that and that was good quality hmm. so when kevin was asked you know was it like walking into king tut's tomb he, he you know he didn't lie about it but he also didn't say what, that he found nothing because you know it, it probably at that point was sort of impolitic to do that so he just sort of talked around it and yet, you know, if you look up the articles from the time the first set was released, there are a number of journalists who just wrote a direct quote attributed to Howlett saying, it was like King Tut's tomb when I walked in there. <laughs> um, but what they also found probably before the first EMI BBC set, um, and certainly I think more so after, is um, two things. They found some of the BBC engineers had taken tapes home. Um, and that's why, for instance, you have that um, I Feel Fine uh, outtakes, you know, with the, the talking in between. I mean, that's because that's mm -hmm. the session tape. The other thing that I guess Kevin hadn't thought about when he first put the show together was that apart from the actual programs the Beatles appeared on, you know, Saturday Club and Teenager's Turn and Here We Go and, and all the Pop Go the Beatles and From Us to You shows, what the BBC used to do is put together a series called Top of the Pops for foreign use. And the Top of the Pops shows were not actual shows in the sense that, you know, people would come in on Saturday morning to be on Saturday Club and they'd do the broadcast and that was it. What they would do is they would take the tapes from all those shows of the, the previous few weeks and they would cut together a show for Top of the Pops with new intros and outros and, you know, the music was the same music that you heard on Saturday Club, etc. Um, those things were pressed as LPs and sent all over the world to the BBC's various outposts. And once they got serious about looking for this stuff, they were able to reconstruct an awful lot of it from the top of the Pops discs. Um, and that's why we're also now seeing so many other 1960s groups. Um, because, you know, the, those original tapes were wiped too, but the top of the Pops shows are out there. And, uh, you know, in fact, every now and then you run into a, a disc, a, a broadcast disc uh, being auctioned or put up on eBay or something like that. It doesn't always have Beatles on it, but those things are there. Yeah. And you can also tell that the, the remaster that came out a few years ago, to me anyway, to my ears, I think it was a noticeable improvement over the, the 1994 release. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, I've also noticed that there are certain songs like Soldier of Love, where towards the end, 
of the song. It sounds like there's a drop in the level hmm. of the volume. I don't know if you picked up on that. So there are a few songs that are like that. I don't there's recall others, those. Um, where there was one where they sort of looped a drum intro, and I mean, and it sounds obviously looped. I can't remember which one it is, but yeah. And another thing that they did that I, you know, wholeheartedly disapprove of is that in some of the dialogue, they edited out a line here or there. So, right. that, you know, you still need the bootlegs for for a lot of the stuff. I mean, if you want to hear it as it was broadcast, that's where you have to go, unfortunately. Yeah, right. I also wanted to mention, since I talked about George Harrison before and hearing his lead guitar work on, on these recordings, there's some exciting drumming from Ringo. Mm-hmm. on some of these recordings and, and in particular um ooh my soul some of the faster ones like that one and i'm gonna sit right down and cry over you is it's exciting to hear he's kind of all over the place on the drums on that one mm-hmm. so like i said it's interesting to really study this stuff and hear they're improving as musicians you know as time goes on yeah uh, Ringo was a great live drummer early on. I mean, once they couldn't hear themselves and knew that nobody else could hear them, he sort of got a little lazy, as they all did. But, you know, you look at the Washington Coliseum concert and you listen to these BBC tracks, um, and which are basically live recordings, um, and, you know, he's he's absolutely there. It's true. Yeah. And kind of like one of the things that we're fascinated by as we studied the Beatles is that when they did cover songs, they did cover some familiar songs, some Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly and people like that. But at the same time, they also like to find B-sides and lesser known hits. Mm -hmm. Like we used to always talk about Devil in Her Heart. You know, that's a really obscure song when you get down to it. But um, to do a song like, and actually this was a top 20 hit in America, but I'll bet a lot of Beatle fans later on, as they're discovering this, didn't know the song, would be, I just don't understand. Mm-hmm. I mean, what what an odd choice yeah. <laughs> for the group to do. And I love the fact that they would mix familiar with obscure, or relatively obscure. And the Honeymoon um, song. The Honeymoon yeah. song's a weirdo, too. I mean... <laughs> right. Yeah, there were a bunch uh, And especially, especially who the, when you're talking about it, I just don't understand, especially who did that. And mm-hmm. Margaret, I mean, that's that's as off the wall as you can, kind of off the wall as you can get, you know. Mm-hmm. And Honeymoon Song, the same thing. I mean, that's that's an exceptionally off the wall song. And, and, and the fact that he let, he gave it to Mary Hopkins later. So, I mean, he obviously, yep. lo- he obviously loved it. Mm-hmm. So... So the fact that these were songs that the Beatles were listening to, that alone is an interesting, you know, part of their history to to study why we study the BBC stuff. A song like So How Come No One Loves Me, which we wouldn't even know most likely here in the U.S. for the Everly Brothers. Just to know that the Beatles were discovering these songs and these were the ones that interested them for some reason. I find that fascinating. And also knowing if you go back to the first two sessions they did for BBC Radio, while they still had Pete Best, mm. they did Dream Baby, the Roy Orbison song. And mm-hmm. the Beatles never covered Roy Orbison. Otherwise. You know? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. It, 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 yeah. yeah. Obviously, that, that was, a, that was, a, that was a, kind of a salute to Roy, obviously. So. Let's talk about those first two sessions, because EMI has released nothing from those first two sessions. And... Uh, you know, they exist, they're not in stellar sound quality, but you can hear them, and they are obviously super historic sessions. I mean, especially that first Teenager's Turn, March 7th, 62, hadn't been signed by anybody. Um, They'd failed at DECA, they were still being shopped around by Brian, and you've got Dream Baby, Memphis, and Please Mr. Postman, which that performance of Please Mr. Postman was apparently, according to, um, I believe, Mark Lewison's book, the first time a Tamla Motown song was played on the BBC. And it was the Beatles doing it. And I mean, that to me is, it, it, it may strike a lot of people as a footnote, but to me, that's major. Mm hmm. You know, and so that. To know that they recognize Motown, you know. 
Yeah, and that they were the first, they, an unsigned band from the north of England, were the first ones to come to London and play a Motown Tamla song on the BBC. I, I think that's uh, an incredibly important thing. And, and so that, you know, f forget about the sound quality, Apple. Just put mm. that out. It is a piece of history that should be out there for people to hear. Yeah, I think it was Kevin Howlett that said, and we might have, he might have said this when you and I interviewed him, Steve. It proved that the Beatles were great talent scouts. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they could pick out a song like Please, Mr. Postman and look at how legendary the whole Motown label has become in their whole history. So, and also in that second session, they did A Picture of You, mm -hmm. which was a Joe Brown song. Right. And, um, you know, Joe became good friends with the Beatles right. and closed the concert for George. <laughs> right. You know, and um, yeah. And they did the Roy Orbison song before they toured with Roy Orbison. Right. So, uh, you know, I just find it interesting that they were discovering this music somehow. It's not as if all this music were major hits on BBC radio. Right. So They have plenty of music left out of those sessions that they could put out a third. CD, easily. so easily. Yeah. EMI, are you listening? <laughs> and also, there are outtakes that were never broadcast, like Sheila, and right. you know, Three Cool Cats. But I mean, they did it other times, and and we have them doing it, and we have Sheila from Hamburg. But um, mm -hmm. you know, would be nice. It'd be nice to have this. a studio. Yeah. Yeah. A studio right. recording of that. Yeah. And also, there's a few songs that they did for the BBC that they also did for DECA and you can hear the difference mm -hmm. in how, how much they progressed yeah. from there. Uh, a song like Memphis, for example, or Till There Was You. Yeah. And I must say that, uh, well, first of all, you, you mentioned Soldier of Love, Steve. On my live show for Every Little Thing, that is the most requested of all the BBC recordings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of fans recognize that, you know, that was just a great song and a great recording of it. But To Know Her Is To Love Her is one of my favorites of all these recordings, because I'm a sucker for great harmonies. And, uh, you know, they really nailed it on their BBC performance of that. So I want to bring Clarabella back in, back up again. What is, what do you, where does that stand on your on your list, Ken, as far as... Um popularity with uh, requests i you never know? get a request for that song <laughs> really <laughs> never because no. i think that's a great song I, I i do you know partially because the beatles never touched it any other time but it's a i think it's a great song alan um yeah i think it i think it is in the um spirit of um paul's little richard type things you know it's um it's another another one of those uh I, it would be would be interesting if um you know you could put out at least a side of paul doing little richard stuff oh yeah oh yeah um, and that, for that sure would be sort of interesting <laughs> and have john doing chuck berry on the other side make it a double album have george do carl perkins there's probably enough stuff to sustain that, just about. You might have to mm -hmm. skip away from Carl Perkins and go to Elvis for, um, you know, I f forgot to remember to forget and bring in Paul's That's All Right Mama. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you could do, you know, you could do, you could get Morris Levy to put out, you know, the Beatles sing Roots. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, my God. Uh-oh. Yeah. Since I mentioned the DECA audition, to know her is to love her. Compare that to the BBC. Mm -hmm. It's like night and day. Mm -hmm. Or, or crying, waiting, hoping, for that matter. So, yeah. I mean, this this is a treasure trove to me of great material. And, um, you know, I'm glad that those two volumes did come out, but there could easily be a third. But it would have to be almost all songs, their original songs, so. Yeah, I would want them to, instead of doing a third, I'd want them to just go through and put out the tapes complete and chronological. No, mm -hmm. no comments edited out, no stuff looped, any of that kind of stuff. Just put out the set. Uh, you know, they could get the, um, the, the best one now is um, put out by someone who 
calls himself for this purpose, Lord Wreath. And he put out something like, I think it was like a 27 disc set. Mm -hmm. Um, Now there were repeats because for instance, um, he had uh, a couple of discs of uh, Saturday club fifth birthday show um, on which the Beatles appeared, but he's got complete shows, you know, and then, I think the Beatles part alone is elsewhere in the set. And there there are a couple of um, repeated things, you know, that, that make sense in the context of what he's presenting. But he's presenting absolutely everything. And I think it included a DVD of some BBC TV stuff, too. Uh, mm-hmm. You know what? I mean, I know probably <laughs> for a fact that he wouldn't mind if EMI just took his set pressed it up and put it out because sure. it's um it's the best quality of you know of all the tracks that are available at this point and it's what a serious collector would want in that it's chronological and as complete as we can get our hands on you know it's known that there are other bbc tapes out there that have not been bootlegged and have not been trading with people uh you know that, that collectors are just sort of holding back it would be great if those could be liberated too but you know it'll happen probably eventually and and uh somebody and because as an as a you know cheaper priced alternative to the full set uh emi could put out say a a double disc set with uh full shows on each side so or two full shows on each side actually because some of them are pretty short so, all right, good suggestions. It also is worth noting that there's certain songs that the Beatles did for BBC Radio that they never did live of their own material. Mm-hmm. So it makes it uh, more worth your while to check out, even if they're very close to the studio recordings. Certain songs like "I Should Have Known Better," "I'm Happy Just to Dance with You," "I Call Your Name," which is interesting because John messes up the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Also, um, apparently they did record Hello Little Girl for one of the broadcasts. Mm-hmm. Actually, it was supposed to be the first one with Pete Best, mm-hmm. and but that was never broadcast. That's a pity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's also the fact that actually once they did a song completely differently, and that was when John sang Honey Don't twice in 63 and 64. And actually, and that whole brings up the whole question of you know, why they did that and what led them to give it to Ringo. So I think it was just that Ringo yeah. didn't have anything to sing on Beatles for sale. So mm-hmm. he, he took that one over. Uh, right. But, right. Yeah. yeah. There are some other um, interesting little anomalies among, you know, this isn't one of the 36, but um, Hard Day's Night. When they recorded it for the BBC, I guess it was shortly after they had finished the studio recording. And as you will recall, the studio recording has George Harrison and George Martin playing the solo together. And I think that was one where they half-speeded it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, George, um, eventually, you know, by the summer of 64, he was out playing the solo live and it was perfectly fine. But he had not at that point mastered it at full speed um and so when they recorded it for the bbc they recorded it without the solo originally um and i have a version of it that just sort of goes along without the solo it's you know but for um at least one of the broadcasts it may have may have been broadcast that way once and possibly on top of the pops but for the broadcast of the the show that it was on which was what uh can't remember saturday club from hard no hard day's night was only on top gear and from us to you okay so when they recorded it for uh i think from us to you uh what they did is they took the studio solo and they edited it in if you listen to the uh, bbc track of that you can hear that edit if if you are listening closely Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also a version without the edit and without the solo at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. Since you yeah. mentioned from us to you, we should also mention that that is another one that they changed because it wasn't. I, I mean, they took from me to you and changed it. So. Well, that's just 
because that was the name of the show. Right, but I mean, <laughs> when we're talking about revising songs, like uh, revisions of songs, that goes along with that. So and they also yeah. did that medley, that medley for Christmas, the Christmas medley, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And those things don't usually count in the thirty-six, do they? No, not at all. So there's really thirty-eight. Yeah, but they don't count, Alan. Right. So it's just the 36. Okay. (laughs) But they should count because it's the Beatles. The same with when they sang the side-by-side theme. I think if they're on it, I think if they're on it, we should add it to stuff that should be considered a Beatles recording. Right. (laughs) They're not full, complete songs. That's true. But anyway, and one other thing that we do mention from time to time that's interesting about the BBC recordings is how many lead vocals we got from George Harrison, Mm -hmm. which certainly was the change for uh, the records for the albums for EMI. But that apparently came from Brian Epstein, at least, uh, you know, from from what uh, we've read, from what Mark Lewison has written, because I think that it made the Beatles even more appealing and more more saleable you know to have three lead vocalists Mm -hmm. on their songs and so you know it's unique alone to have two (laughs) but to have three and that's why with the uh deck audition recordings you had a bit more of george than you would expect so you can see the same thing happening here with the live performances especially from 1963 and there's so many great rockabilly songs i mean we talk about carl perkins and all but nothing shaken it's one of my favorite mm-hmm. of the BBC performances right there. I should also bring up I Got a Woman. What a great recording that is. You know, and mm-hmm. um, when you listen to the, the double disc of Live at the BBC, that's the first of the unreleased songs. It's just such a great opening song of those. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just electric. It, it really was captured so well, performed so well. So many great performances on here. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I think we should also mention that, you know, for anybody that wants more information, obviously the Howlett books, um, especially the last one, are the, you know, are the place to go for information, along with Mark Lewison's book. But the Howlett book, you know, concentrates on that completely. I mean, it's avail- it's readily available. I don't have the blue version. I noticed the blue version is going for like $150. What is th- – there's no difference in the blue version, right? You, either of you guys have that blue version? No. Yeah, I don't. I, I I didn't bother to get it either, but it's it's going for a huge amount of money uh, on Amazon, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. But but there's also two earlier versions of Howlett's books. Um, he did the really really thin Beatles of the Bee, uh, sixty-two to sixty-five. That came out. God, I I, I mean I remember that. Years and years ago, I'm trying to look at the copyright here. It says first published in '82, and then there was a an upgraded version, a little expanded version called The Beatles at the BBC: The Radio Years, '62 to '70, that has more information, but not nearly. That came out in '96, but not nearly the the stuff that the the box set has, and that has you know memorabilia, um, replicas, and all that stuff, and, and um, that. That is really, you know, if you really have to have all the information there is, that's the place to get it. The first one, the paperback, if you're really collecting everything, is mm-hmm. also available in a hardcover Perian Press edition. Or not, a copy. Ah. it was available. It uh, was available. It's out there um, probably on eBay somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. Okay. So anything else you guys want to add about the BBC performances? Give us more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, EMI, if you're listening, or Universal, you know, we'd love to see more of this, or Apple. All right, then. So why don't we just give all of our folks listening our contact information, beginning with you, Steve. My email address is beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles news and information news group where I post all sorts of Beatles news. As far as the show is concerned, you can write to us. With all your comments, questions, money, whatever, <laughs> C- CD- CDs at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. There's a Facebook f- page, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. There's a second 
Facebook page, things we said today for the Fab Four radio uh, broadcasts. Uh, they broadcast our show on the weekends. Thank you, Matt. Um, and, and and they also bro- they also broadcast Ken's show. Uh, yes, which is on yes. right before, which is on right before things we said today on right. Sunday nights at eleven. Thank, and uh, thanks to Michael Lynch, who I'm sure is listening. Michael, uh, we don't mention your name enough. Thank you for composing the wonderful theme song to our show. Have I? What have I left out? Oh, we're on YouTube. We're on Podbean. And somebody just, uh, Harold uh, uh, Lepidus, who uh, did our Dylan Beatles show a, uh, a while back, cued me into the fact that Podbean has an app. And I've known about the app, but I haven't really used it. But I downloaded it this week and used it, and it also streams the show, so it's very it's very easy to use. So if you're looking for another source of streaming besides YouTube, uh, the Podbean app will will do the trick. Plus, we're all over the place. Uh, I, a lot of programs that that pick up uh, shows uh, like ours will have our show. So there we go. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Of course, if you're listening it, to it now, you already know how to listen to it. That's right. That's right. Alan, how about you? Um, you can reach me through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and I'm having a contest, which is, if you guess what it is, you win. <laughs> very good, Alan. That's, that's, like that. that's very Yoko-ish. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. That's, wow. that's good. That's good. <laughs> we should let her know about that. <laughs> and uh, as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Don't forget, every single week you can visit my Beatles trivia and games page and win one of nine great prizes every single week. And I just did an interview with another Beatles author, Jerry Hammock who's written a couple of books so far. There'll be four in total called The Beatles Recording Reference Manual. It really explains the whole recording process of what the Beatles were involved with. And um, that interview can now be found on my interviews page four page, which is the same one that has all my recent ones with Jude Kessler and Jimmy Webb, Brian Ray, The Weaklings, Neil Innes. They're all there on that page. And I just want to make a quick mention that on June the 9th, I will be one of the MCs for the Beatle Festival that takes place every year in Connecticut. It's called the Fab Four Music Festival, and that'll be happening at the Oakdale Theater in Wallingford on June the 9th. And there's 20 acts all together from New York and New England, all Beatles tribute bands playing Beatles and solo. And there's 10 acts that perform indoors, 10 acts that perform outdoors. 